Hello and welcome. We are now in lesson five. You are more than halfway there. This is amazing. You've made it this far. I'm really excited. So today we will look at chapters six and seven. And let me tell you what they are. We're talking about the fearless are decisive. And chapter seven talks about the currency of the fearless. Yes, the currency. We'll talk all about it. But let's pray first. Father, I thank you. I give you praise and honor and glory. I magnify your name, Lord. I make it bigger than every other name. And I say right now that we come boldly and we're so grateful for the opportunity, for the possibility through Jesus to come boldly before your throne of grace and mercy. And we cry with the angels and we say, Lord, you are holy, holy, holy. And you are the Lord God Almighty. There is no one else greater than you. And there never will be. So Lord, we hook in with Almighty, Almighty, everything that you are, we hook in with that today. And we speak right now into the atmosphere and we say that Holy Spirit is the voice we hear. No other voice gets to even sound what they want to tell us. But Father, we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and we listen, obey, and put into action everything that we hear, every correction, every instruction, every revelation from the Holy Spirit we, we utilize today. And Lord, I pray that fruit will abound in, in every person as they hear and they grow in your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Are you ready? Let's look at our first uh, lesson in chapter 6. The fearless are decisive. Now here we see Proverbs 21.30 is the verse that I have right here in the beginning. And it says, There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. Think about this for a minute. Fear comes into a place to distort the plan of God and create a new plan. But right here the word tells us in Proverbs 21.30 that no plan could ever succeed against the Lord. If you just take some time as part of your lesson review, and I want you to meditate on the concept. Chew it over. Just think about it. That no plan can succeed against God. This is going to set your mind, and we're going to talk later about our mindset. It's going to be amazing. So you guys stay tuned in the next lessons. But you're, this is going to set your mind that if you had any idea or any thoughts or you had any kind of belief system lingering in you that said, if God asked me to do something and I do it, it'll fail. I want you to squish it right now with this verse because none of God's plans will fail. It will succeed. God's plans always succeed. And you are one of God's plans. Yes, you are. Psalm 139. By now you should know that one too because I talk about it a lot. But Psalm 139, God planned you. He didn't just drop you here. You just aren't an accident because somebody did something. God planned you. He sent you here at this time. You know, my parents, when they first got married, they uh, couldn't have kids for five years. They went to the doctor. They um, had all these tests done. And the doctor says, I don't know what's wrong with you, but there's nothing wrong with you physically. Don't know why you're not having kids. And at this time, they still lived in Guyana, where I'm from in South America. And so the uh, medical help was limited. But the doctor they did go to said, there's nothing wrong with you. And my dad was given a scholarship to go to Bible college in Jamaica. And after my dad was there for a while, the principal had to send to get my mom because nobody believed he was married. He was so handsome. All the girls were after him. So they sent and, and brought my mom over. And when my mom went to Jamaica, my, uh, my dad and my mom were in Jamaica. I was conceived. And so there, that's where I got my name Fiona from. Otherwise, it would have been Mary Ann. But instead, it's Fiona Ann. I like Fiona better. So anyway, that's how uh, I was conceived in Jamaica. But there was no, no other um, explanation of why I wasn't born. But I have one. I would have been five years older. I'm glad I'm not five years older today. <laughs> I would have missed lots of opportunities because it would have been five years sooner. I wouldn't have been in the places I've been at the age I was to have the things happen in my life that God wanted me to have happen. 
I probably wouldn't be speaking to you today. You would never probably have even seen me. God has a perfect plan for your life. As parents, sometimes we want kids and we plan out, you know, we're going to have a child on this. We want to have children now. And this is when we're going to get pregnant. This, But God has a plan. And if it's not your part of the plan for that child to come yet, it most likely won't. And you just keep waiting. But the, the key is, these are the times in our life when, when the spirit of fear will come in and say, well, this hasn't happened yet, so that means it's probably not God's will. The devil does not get to talk to you about God's will. Make that something that you always have. The devil never gets to talk to you about God's will. Only the Holy Spirit gets to talk to you about God's will. So if it's the Holy Spirit saying to you, well, it's probably not God's time, I'll tell you right now, the Holy Spirit will never say that phrase. You know why? When the Holy Spirit says something to you, he never used the word probably. He'll either say it is not God's time or it is God's time. There'll never be a maybe or I'm not sure. No, the Holy Spirit is very sure. So when those words precede something that someone is saying to you, just kind of dismiss it or take it to God and let him correct what was said. All right. Now, let's keep going with this. Decisiveness occurs whether we think we're being decisive or not. Do you realize if you don't make a decision, that is a decision, that you have not made a decision? <laughs> Okay, but to be decisive is to take control of something that has to do with your life. You are taking control of the thing you're supposed to be in control of. I believe personally that if many people would consider taking more control over their own life, making decisions that they have been putting off, it will be much easier to want to be tempted to control other people's lives. This is where people get into trouble. They're kind of scared to do the things that God has asked them to do. The spirit of fear is operating there. So they go around everywhere else trying to tell everyone else what they should do with their life. That's not how you want to live. I want you to be very decisive. How can you be decisive? First of all, the basis for why you do things should always be because you listen to God and he gave you an instruction. When God gives you an instruction, it's not your decision to say, oh, I wonder how I'm going to do it and where it's going to happen. And how. You just simply, first thing you have to do is say, yes, Lord. Yes. When you say yes, it opens access to the entire package God had prepared for that thing to happen. So you don't have to try to look at the package first and then you're going to say, okay, I see the package now. I say yes. The package seen is it shows that you really have no faith for the thing that God wants you to do. Your faith part in every matter is simply that you will say yes at the first time. Okay? So God asks you to do something, you say yes. That's probably the first place you want to start being decisive. If you can't say yes to God easily, then you need to build your confidence up in your relationship with God. Something there is telling you that, you know, God doesn't have my best interest in mind. I, I know he's done great things for other people. He must really love them a lot. But for some reason, when it comes to me, every time I do something for God, it always backfires and something bad always happens to my family or something bad always happens in my life or you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop. That phrase, waiting for the other shoe to drop, is another way of saying that I'm just waiting for something bad to happen. Well, that's fear operating because if you're waiting for something bad to happen, you're standing in fear because you're like, I wonder when it's going to happen. I wonder when everything's going to fall apart. I wonder. No, live a life full of faith. You're going, remember, from, you're going from life to life more abundantly. You're not going down. You're not, you go, oh, I'm going down there. No, there's nothing down there that you want. You want everything. You're, you're seated in heavenly places with Christ. So your life is going up all the time. All right, so let's look at Galatians chapter 4, verse 30 to 31. But what does the scripture say? Cast out and send away the slave woman and her son. For never shall the son of the slave woman be heir and share the inheritance with the son of the free woman. So brethren, we who are born again are not children of a slave woman, the natural, but of the free, the supernatural. Galatians 5.1 says, In this freedom Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then, and do not be hampered and held ensnared, and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put 
off. So we know because the spirit of fear operates in the natural realm, in the realm of the enemy, the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind operates in the supernatural realm of the Holy Spirit. We could see clearly from this scripture, one realm, the natural, is slavery and bondage. The other realm, the supernatural, it is freedom and life. And Galatians 5.1, I love this verse because it says, it was for freedom that Christ has made us free. So we are made free for freedom. We're not made free to constantly be rehashing what we did when we were slaves. Who wants to do that? If a natural slave was ever freed from slavery, the last thing they should be doing is thinking about all the stuff they did when they were slaves and they weren't paid for it. That's just going to drag life down. Now, what they should be thinking, thinking about now is I'm free now. What new thing do I get to do that I couldn't do before because I was a slave? This is how I want you to think of your Christian life. Don't think of it in terms of, I've got to fight the enemy. I've got to fight against this addiction. I've got to fight against this fear. I'm always having to watch my back. No, if the enemy is under your feet, why is he behind you that you could look at him so clearly? I always say in order for me to see the enemy, I got to take my shoes off, do all this work. I don't want to see him. He's under my feet. Where I walk, if he decides to show up, he has to be under my feet. He can't be in front of me face to face. He can't be looking at me and giving me instructions and talking to me. This is how you have to see the enemy, no matter what form and what spirit it shows up in. In this series, we're talking about the spirit of fear, but there's lots of other ways that the enemy can come at folks. But this one is key because it brings with it so many other things. So we see here that it was for freedom that Christ has made us free. The decision I want you to make from this chapter of, and this lesson that I'm teaching right now is, Make the decision to behave like a free person. Make the decision to learn the new things you have now that you are free. You might say, well, I've been a Christian 30 years and I've been reading the Bible through for 30 years. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I want you to discover, discover things by revelation. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you things. The Bible says he is our teacher and he is our guide. Ask him for a tour guide of the stuff you get to be partakers of because you're free. That's what I want you to do now. So in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 30, it says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Can you imagine that? The yoke of Jesus is what the context was. It's easy and it's light. And the yoke accomplishes something. See, with the enemy, the enemy's yoke in your life is simply to tie you up and hold you down. I spoke of depression in a previous lesson. The spirit of fear ties you up, holds you down in depression. You're like a walking dead, not, not able to do anything, not functioning, afraid of everybody, everything, afraid of germs, afraid to go in this room, afraid everywhere you go. But the spirit of freedom, Galatians 5.1, freedom comes to free us from all those things. We have authority over things. We have authority to walk in, in freedom and to be bold. So that's, that's one decision you have to make. That's just one decision, but it's a, it's a big one. So I want you to focus on making that decision. Now I say in, in chapter, in this chapter on page 70 to be exact in my book, I talk about not falling prey to lies and one of the things that the enemy does is to lie to you and tell you that it's too late or you're too far gone and you can't change this now. Well, you can't change it, but you can submit to the changer, the one who gives us new creation, the, ones who make, the one who makes all things new, and that's what you can do. So those are just some of the tools I want you to think of when you think about your freedom and the new tools you have as being a free person. In this chapter, I do have assignments for you in the back, and it says, uh, fearless action number one, it says, what do you see now in your life that is a yoke that does not come from God? I want you to think about things you're yoked up to, bad relationships, fearful things, all these things you're yoked up to, they're, they're not from God. And I want you to, to write it down if you want to, 
write it down, but I want you to identify them. And then you're going to speak freedom. Galatians 5, 1, speak freedom over yourself in this matter. And then go through these uh, exercises. I don't have any additional questions for you because I want you to focus on that one specific thing that I asked you to do. And that is to think of what tools you have now that you're free. Ask the Holy Spirit for a guided tour. He's going to be the one that asks you the questions today on this assignment. Let's go to chapter 7. And I want to briefly look at the currency of the fearless and explain to you how, how the fearless operate. The fearless does not um, take things that don't belong to them. That's how fear operates. Fear goes in and takes things that don't belong to, to them. The spirit of fear is all about force, is all about stealing, killing, and destroying. The fearless operates within the system that God created. And the system God created to operate in his kingdom requires faith. I would not want to displease my, my boss. You know, let's say I work for a company that's very good to me, very good to me, treats me well. And I decide, you know, I just would not, I, I decide purposely not to please the boss or the owners. I just constantly displease them and whatever actions I take. That would not be a very good thing to do. And probably I would not be in very good favor with them simply because of my actions towards them, not how they felt about me. Well, in the spirit, in the spirit realm, in God's kingdom, the spirit of light, um, the kingdom of light, the, the currency that's utilized there is faith. Faith is the currency to get things done. Let's look at Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. So then faith come in by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's currency is backed up by his word, which means its value is never going to go down. You can increase the value of God's currency in your life by building your faith. You get to decide just how high or how low the currency of God's kingdom operates in your life. Every country has a different value for their dollar. And if you're exchanging rates between one country to another, there's a ratio. There's a, in, in Guyana, it's a 200 to 1 for American dollars. So one American dollar is 200 Guyana dollar at the time of this recording. Well, that, you could be a millionaire easy because you have a couple thousand Guyana, uh, American dollars and you get you know, a few million out of it. But, but it's still the money that operates in that country. What, what value is the currency of faith in your life? How strong is it? How, how big is it? You know, Jesus talked to people about little faith and dead faith and weak faith. But how strong is your faith and how big is it? It's all dependent on you. God's word is the same word that the person with big faith uses and the person with little faith uses. It's simply our use of it. And if you're using other currency in your life, like the spirit of fear's words, and you're not using God's currency, which is his word, which, which we take by faith, that weakens your faith. The currency is weak in your life. So I want you to take a look at this chapter and I want you to go through and really read it for yourself. This is a very personal lesson I want you to learn. So I want you to personally take time to read through this and, and develop your faith. I talk a lot about the faith that we need, uh, how we develop faith. Romans 10, 17 is the key verse here. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I, I can talk to you more about this lesson, but I won't build your faith. It's the word of God that will build your faith. But I've given you a few pointers that I want you to follow. Mark eleven twenty two says, have faith in God. When, when, they, when they asked Jesus a question, he said, have faith in God. He didn't even say have faith in me. He said have faith in God. So this is key. Let's go to the end and I want you to look at the lessons that I have specifically, the questions I have specifically for you at the end of this. Meditation on this chapter is very key because I do have verses for you to meditate on to get it. See, if you don't have the currency um, equipment in your mind and in your life, if you don't have your mind renewed on it, your, your value is going to be very low of the word of God. You're actually going to consider it not very valuable. So I want you to build up the value of the word of God in your mindset. And it says in, in the first question is, do you feel as though your faith currency has a high value right now? That's a good thing to just take a, a record of and evaluate where you are and then go from there. 
okay? I hope that you've learned a lot from this lesson. It's a very potent lesson. So I want, to, I want you to just take, refresh yourself back in it, read the chapter, and go through it again. Father, I thank you for this group today, and I pray that your anointing will be open to them, that they can uh, understand revelatory what it is you're saying in your word. Let them be, have revelation on faith, and let them have revelation of making proper decisions in their life. Thank you, Lord, for your word that is so powerful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you in our next lesson.